This is section 119 of Mark Twain's Speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Our Guest Lord Mayor's Banquet for Mark Twain, Town Hall, Liverpool, July 10, 1907. Read by John Greenman. My Lord Mayor, my Lord Bishop, and gentlemen, I want to thank you, my Lord Mayor, for the welcome you have given me tonight, and I thank these gentlemen for their hearty response in which they have received the toast. And I will thank any other name? I only know him by Te Pei. I have another name, Langhorn, but it really doesn't belong to me. Then you have a telegram from Professor Boyce, who says he still has a watch. That comes of having a fleeting reputation. I came to this country distinguished for honesty, and then somebody took that Ascot cup, just as I arrived, which has thrown a gloom over my whole stay here, and will provide sorrow and lamentations for my friends on the other side. And now I am held responsible for the regalia which has been stolen from Dublin Castle. What will become of my reputation if I do not get out of the country very soon? People say it is a curious coincidence that the Ascot Cup and the regalia from Dublin Castle should have been stolen during my stay, and so it is. I was going to Dublin. Fortunately, for the rags of my reputation, I could not get there. And you say, what is this? It is rumor. Nobody comes out and charges me with carrying away that robbery. It is mere human testimony, and it does not amount to testimony. It is merely rumor, circumstantial evidence, mere human speech, assertion, rumor, and suspicion. But circumstantial evidence is the best evidence in the world. Once a month for five hundred years certain officers whose function it is go down the cellars in Dublin Castle, and there they find the safe in which the precious jewels are kept, and take them out, one by one, daily, just to see that they are all right, and put them back in the safe. They have been doing this for five hundred years, and they have got so used to it that they did not shut up the safe. I should like to know whether that is a good safe and a valuable safe. That is an important feature for me, because with the reputation which I have got now, all the circumstantial evidence would point to the fact that if I took anything at all, I would not merely have carried off the regalia, but the safe along with it. All this is testimony in my favor, and yet Professor Boyce is afraid to bring along his watch, which is probably only a Waterbury, and an old one at that. Mr. O'Connor has furnished you information that enabled you to understand that I have been a jack of all trades. That is quite true. He said a word about my father. He was a lawyer, but my father was entitled to more words than that. He was another of my kind. He was not just merely a lawyer, but in that little village on the banks of the Mississippi, when I was a boy, he was mayor of the town, the chief of police, the postmaster, the one policeman, and the sheriff who had to hang all the malefactors. In fact, he was the entire government concentrated. Now, you can't pass by a man like that 
with just a word mr o'connor spoke of my mother too well my brother and i were twins he was born ten years before i was a little discrepancy that never could be accounted for it was the intention that that brother of mine should be a lazy person i know that perfectly well but somehow or other it missed fire and i was born that way instead i have been lazy ever since and indolent while that brother the twin he was full of energy and the spirit of labor whatever he put his hand to he worked at it hard and faithfully and the result was the result was that he could never make a living anyhow i can't help being frivolous tonight because i have followed out my instructive and natural custom this afternoon by having a sleep and resting myself whenever i am rested and feeling good i can't help being frivolous it is only when i am weary and worn out and discouraged that the time comes for me to take a hold on great national questions and handle them i wanted to talk real instructive wisdom tonight but this rest has intervened and put it all out of my mind i have been two or three weeks discussing cheap penny international postage with mr henniker heaton and i have told him all i know about it and now he knows nothing about it himself i said i was born lazy but i was born wise also and the only time i ever lost a situation the only time i was ever discharged from a post was in san francisco more than forty years ago when i was a reporter on the morning call i was discharged just that once in my life and the only thing they could bring against me was that i was incompetent and incandescent and inharmonious and everything they could think of in three syllables but mainly i was lazy and inefficient that was the only time anybody ever found fault with me for a thing like that it was occurring all the time in fact it was monotonous and it was no use picking out a thing like that according to te pei i have been a little of everything this time i am an ambassador i like that position very well i don't mind it as it has not a salary attached to it because a salary limits your energy it does mine always i would rather be free to do my ambassadorial work after my own fashion and i intend to keep up this ambassadorial business right along whenever i find a chance of encouraging the good feeling between this old mother country and her eldest child over there i intend to put in my word and keep up the ambassadorial work the university of oxford in making me a doctor has added one more function to my numerous functions and somebody asked me a rather pointed question was it not rather a delicate thing to make you a doctor of literature are you competent to doctor your own a little well, that is all wrong i have been doctoring my own literature it is only now by the authority of oxford that i propose to doctor other peoples and i hope you will see results why i have always had an interest in literature outside my own concern 
i have always been ready to give a helping hand to a rising young author i saved one poet in san francisco forty years ago and i don't forget it i did a good turn to that poet i was ready to doctor him or anybody else well he wasn't much of a poet a kind of poet good enough for the early days of the pacific he was not prosperous and he was named ediston we called him ediston lighthouse that was sarcasm he was not a lighthouse he was in trouble and i came to the young man's help i was a reporter but i was likely to lose the employment at any time and i knew it would be such a good thing for me if i could do something rather extraordinary to keep ahead of the other papers well the young poet got discouraged his poetry began to be a drug he could not sell it and by and by when he could not give it away his circumstances were desperate and he came to me as a friend and wise adviser and he proposed to commit suicide i told him it was a good idea it was a good idea in various ways it would relieve him from writing poetry and it would relieve the community from reading it and it would give me a chance with my newspaper i being the only other person present at the suicide i would take care of that he was a little sorry to see me so enthusiastic i could not help that my heart was in it we discussed methods and i told him the most picturesque was the revolver to blow his brains out with he did not like that idea very much but i reconciled him to it but we did not have any money to buy a revolver and we went round to the place with the three balls there was a revolver there just the right thing but we could not borrow that revolver without furnishing some money i told the gentleman that this was the only chance the young man had but he was that kind of man that you could not persuade at all a man who has no human sympathy although it does not cost anything then i suggested drowning to my friend that would be a neat thing it could not be as fine for me as the other but drowning was good enough when you could not get anything better so we went out to the seashore and he did not like the looks of the water and wanted me to try how it would go but no i was not in that line at all then a most curious thing one of the strangest things a thing you would never imagine at all happened from some ship that had foundered perhaps a thousand miles away there came an object of some interest at that moment there were in fact two events gradually coming together while this young man was brooding and contemplating suicide there was a life preserver floating in from that ship a life preserver for a man who was about to commit suicide it looked ridiculous at first but we took the life preserver to the pawnbroker and traded with him for the revolver and then we made all the arrangements but he didn't like to put the firearm to his forehead i said it will be over in a minute and this seemed to reassure him for he bucked up and blew his brains out people said it wasn't brains but it was there was not much of it but it was real gray matter which is supposed to constitute intelligence so far as it can well that was the making of that boy why when he got well all obstructions were gone and i have thought many times since that if poets when they get discouraged 
would blow their brains out they could write very much better when they got well i landed in this town of liverpool thirty years ago the first time i ever put my foot on english soil and i had an adventure as a matter of fact liverpool is connected with one or two adventures of a very pleasant sort i went to the outside edge of town and i saw the scenery the blocked up windows to escape the window tax and various other exciting things and finally i took a cab and drove around the man was a very good-natured pleasant middle-aged scotchman and he asked me where he should drive me to i said anywhere just around for an hour or two hours he drove me a little way and then stopped and asked me again well i wanted to think i was full of some great project and finally when this had occurred several more times in desperation i said oh take me to balmoral i did not say a word and i did not pay any attention to where he was going i wanted to think i did not know where i was i was away somewhere in the country and i hailed him and asked him where he was going and he said on the way to balmoral so he was i got him to turn round and get back to liverpool if he could to catch a train for london if possible when we got back i asked him what i had to pay and he said well it was equivalent to four hundred dollars i asked him if he was in earnest and he said he was as outside the city he could charge any reasonable price he said that balmoral was four hundred miles away and it would be four hundred dollars it seemed a sorry and embarrassing situation i proposed to go before the rulers of the city or his majesty or something of that sort to lay the case and he did i said he had made a mistake and the authorities said he had a right to charge anything reasonable it seemed a large sum he had charged and they said it was not the cabman's fault it was four hundred miles to balmoral and four shillings a mile was not unreasonable especially as he would have to come back at his own expense well the man acted very handsomely he compromised for twelve dollars though stupid tradition says that scotchmen did not profess a sense of humor i say that that man has a sense of humor what was te pay's early statement that requires refutation mr o'connor i said that you had been a financier i was but i am not now i didn't succeed in it he also mentioned another matter and he paid me the compliment to mention that at the time when i was bankrupt heavily in debt i paid every dollar this is often mentioned very pleasing to me to hear and i feel that i ought to get on my feet and tell you all about it how my business man my long-headed commercial friend said in this bankruptcy business you pay thirty cents to the dollar and you go free now a man can easily be persuaded to go outside the strict moral line but it is not so with a woman and a wife my wife said no you shall pay a hundred cents to the dollar and i will go with you all the way and she kept her word let us give credit where credit is due 
and it is more due to her than to me i don't think i will say anything about the relations of amity existing between our two countries it is not necessary it seems to me the ties between the two nations are so strong that i do not think we need trouble ourselves about them being broken anyhow i am quite sure that in my time and in yours my lord mayor those ties will hold good and please god they always will english blood is in our veins we have a common language a common religion a common system of morals and great commercial interests to hold us together home is dear to us all and i am now departing for mine on the other side of the ocean oxford has conferred upon me the loftiest honor that has ever fallen to my fortune the one i should have chosen as outranking any and all others and more precious to me than any and all others within the gift of men and states to bestow upon me and i have had in the four weeks that i have been here another lofty honor a continuous honor an honor which has known no interruption in all these twenty-six days and a most moving and pulse-stirring honor the hearty hand-grip and the cordial welcome which does not descend from the pale gray matter of the brain but comes up with the red blood out of the heart it makes me proud and it makes me humble many and many a year ago i read an anecdote in dana's book two years before the mast a frivolous little self-important captain of a coastling sloop in the dried apple and kitchen furniture trade was always hailing every vessel that came in sight just to hear himself talk and air his small grandeurs one day a majestic indiaman came ploughing by with course on course of canvas towering into the sky her decks and yards swarming with sailors with macaws and monkeys and all manner of strange and romantic creatures populating her rigging and there too her freightage of precious spices lading the breeze with gracious and mysterious odors of the orient of course the little coaster captain hopped into the shrouds and squeaked out a hail ship ahoy what ship is that and whence and whither in a deep and thunderous bass came the answer back through a speaking trumpet the degom of bengal a hundred and twenty-three days out from canton homeward bound what ship is that the little captain's vanity was all crushed out of him and most humbly he squeaked back only the mary ann fourteen hours out from boston bound for kittery point with uh, with nothing to speak of the eloquent word only expressed the deeps of his stricken humbleness and what is my own case during perhaps one hour in the twenty-four not more than that i stop and reflect then i am humble then i am properly meek and for that little time i am only the mary ann fourteen hours out and cargoed with vegetables and tinware but all the other twenty-three my vain self-satisfaction rides high and i am the stately indiaman ploughing the great seas under a cloud of sail and laden with a rich freightage of the kindest words that were ever spoken to a wandering alien i think 
my twenty-six crowded and fortunate days seem multiplied by five and i am the begum of bengal a hundred and twenty-three days out from canton homeward bound end of our guest read by john greenman this is section one hundred and twenty of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain interview dockside new york july twenty second nineteen o seven on his return from london read by john greenman dr twain if you please that is the only title i am using now uh, just how my old friends are going to get away from calling me mark is something they will have to work out for themselves and when they see me in my new cap and gown they will be bound to fall my dinner with the king did he enjoy it how do i like america <laughs> what do i think of the english women did i get away with the ascot cup the dublin jewels too what's the best story i heard in england who one minute boys give me a chance to think i haven't had any practice for nine days and you remind me of work well the king enjoyed the dinner and that is enough i like america very much i was prepared for that question and uh, nearly all the others but uh, being a good christian i do not dread the worst as to english women i will not commit myself just now uh, this is so sudden i must have time to consider these great questions as to the ascot cup i, I don't mind taking you all into my confidence Shh! it's on board this ship and i expect to go ashore with it if i have any luck and use diplomacy oh yes i have the cup on board and i hope some of you reporters are slick enough to help me smuggle it in through the custom house it would be too bad to give it up after getting so close to home with it but i didn't get the dublin jewels the idea is absurd wasn't the safe left with the character they gave me over on the other side i should certainly not have left the safe i would have taken both the best story i heard in england is not one that i am going to tell now i get thirty cents a word for stories my rate is the same for jokes no rebate did the king crack a joke at the dinner yes but i'm keeping that too i've got a place in the country you know that i have to pay rent for no i wasn't interviewed much in london but my secretary was someone has asked me if anybody else ever succeeded in getting a joke through the english hide now that does not suggest a broad view of the situation humor isn't a thing of race or nationality so much depends upon the environment of a joke to be good it must absorb its setting the american joke does this so does the english believe it or not i have met english jokes that were funny i had not the slightest trouble in getting mine through their heads he was asked if he objected to telling his age not in the least i shall be seventy-two in november 
i do not mind it every year that i gain furnishes a new privilege and all i want to dodge is second childhood at two o'clock in the morning i feel as old as any man at that time you must know that life in every person is at its lowest at that hour i feel as sinful too as possible but the rest of the time i feel as though i were not over twenty-five years old you know one gets back both youth and courage by six o'clock in the morning end of interview read by john greenman this is section one hundred twenty one of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain bishop speech between october fifth and seventeenth nineteen o seven read by john greenman now elliot you have delivered the king's bible sir the rest of your sojourn among us which i hope will be long and pleasant will naturally be devoted to acquiring information about our great country the greatest on earth as you will already have learned from the reporters as you came up the bay and from other shy and blushing sources i am glad of this opportunity to add to your accumulation of american fact and will help you all i can and where i cannot add a fact i shall hope to be useful in explaining facts drawn by you from other authorities our form of government sir is the best that can be devised by human wisdom it being a monarchy a great and free and progressive and enlightened monarchy like your own at home uh, there is a difference but it is only slight and not readily perceptible yours is hereditary monarchy under a permanent family ours is hereditary monarchy under a permanent political party sometimes you call your system a monarchical republic ours is a republican monarchy there is no real difference and i can tell you this both have come to stay you couldn't dislodge ours with dynamite is it good well not as good for the nation as it would be if the two great parties held the power turn about and kept each other from abusing it you will read and hear much of the president of the united states dear sir do not be deceived there is no such person and no such office there is a president of the republican party but there has been only one president of the united states since the country lost mr lincoln forty-two years ago the highest duty of the president of the republican party is to watch diligently over his party's interest urgently promoting all measures good or bad which may procure votes for it and as urgently obstructing all good or bad which might bring its rule into disfavor the party only is hereditary now but the headship of it will be hereditary by and by in a single family uh, pray do not overlook our patriotism sir there is more of it here than exists in any other country it is all lodged in the republican party the party will tell you so 
all others are traitors and are long ago used to the name we impose no penalty upon them except the half of the taxes but russia would send them to siberia publicly sir we are intensely democratic and much given to mocking at royalties and aristocracies but privately we have had that hankering after them and worship of them which has never been absent from any section of the human race we love to look at photographs of princes and princelings and dukes and duchesses greatly preferring them to any other kind of pictures our illustrated papers and magazines know this and they keep this appetite liberally fed the source of this adulation of ours is the same that it is all over the world envy envy of the conspicuous while a president is in office we have pictures of them daily and the telegrams record every wonderful thing they say just as your newspapers do with the profound remarks of august children on your side of the water an american girl would rather marry a title than an angel we are nearly ripe for a throne here in fact all we lack is the name we are a stirring and energetic and enterprising people sir and we do things on a large scale look at our statistics there is nothing elsewhere on the planet like them in europe you think it a proud thing if you kill one or two people a week with automobiles whereas our weekly output amounts to a bartholomew massacre your british railways carry more passengers than do ours yet when it comes to killing and crippling where are you out of sight if you kill and cripple a few dozen people in a year you think it a great thing <laughs> dear sir it is nothing our railways kill ten thousand passengers every year and injure sixty thousand if you would do away with your obstructive block system and protected crossings you could do as well in england you attach an almost sentimental importance to human death and mutilation you are too fastidious about it we used to be like that but we have gotten over it our streets are the property of the transit cars and all that in them is in our great city the cars kill a human being every fifteen hours the year round that is the crop of the suddenly killed seven hundred a month eight thousand five hundred a year ten or twelve thousand a year if you count those that by and by succumb to their injuries and get no mention by car accidents we kill and injure together five thousand six hundred a month without counting sundays seventy thousand a year just the duplicate of what our two hundred and nine thousand miles of american railways do you see aggregate a hundred and forty thousand per annum can you beat that can you even approach it <laughs> no sir no country can approach it at least no foreign country except perhaps shawl if that is a foreign country i don't know when i think of some of our shipments to it i realize that i should feel more or less at home there it wouldn't surprise me there to recognize our american twang here and there and now and then the pleasant accent of your own great country sir when you have a trial 
which is particularly salacious and rotten with indecencies your courts shut out the public and the reporters our way is better and more popular although we do not allow obscene books and pictures to be placed on sale either publicly or privately or sent through the mails we exploit our thaw trials in open court and place the lust breeding details per newspaper and mail under the eyes of sixty million persons per day young and old and do not perceive the curious incongruity of it a wave of crime quite naturally and of necessity follows throughout the land resulting in hundreds and hundreds of atrocities that come to light and those of thousands that are concealed out of shame by the victims and their friends and do not reach the light say one revealed case to two hundred that are never heard of by the public then we clamor for an increased police force to stop the wave that is to say we build a fire in a powder magazine then double the fire department to put it out we inflame wild beasts with the smell of blood and then innocently wonder at the wave of brutal appetite that sweeps the land as a consequence there is going to be another wave sir if you will wait for the new thaw trial i offer to bet you five hundred to one that you will see that wave i mean if you are accustomed to that time-honored british way of arriving at facts that are in doubt if you prefer i will keep it perfectly private you have been hearing about the international yacht race do not let that pretty phrase deceive you sir it is not international not in exchange of benefits all of the really valuable results go to great britain we get none of them the races steadily improve the science of seamanship and the art of shipbuilding but as our monarchy forbids us to have either seamen or ships we get not a single valuable thing out of them unless you may call by that name our never failing showy but spectral and empty victories great britain gets all the champagne we get the bottle great britain gets the oyster <laughs> we get the shell but if we could abolish that expensive and unprofitable sarcasm the international yacht race and substitute an international horse race we could equalize the benefits for we could meet you and often beat you on equable terms and improve our great blue grass stock in the operation for a while then congress would interfere and require our native horses to sail under a foreign register and a foreign flag uh, like our ships i beg you sir to observe our street pavements they are our own invention this is the only place in the world where the pavements consist exclusively of holes with asphalt around them and they are most economical in the world because holes never get out of repair but i must not weary you with adulations of our merits lest i give you the impression that we have no defects which is not the case we have them but we have the art of concealing them it comes from long practice i hope my lord bishop that my native country is treating you as well as that old motherland of ours whence you came has lately treated me as cordially as hospitably as kindly 
and how kindly it was i hope i may without too much presumption use a still warmer word and say affection for it looked like that and i prize that above all the rest at the pier the assembled brawny longshoremen received me with a welcome that touched me deeply and when i had finished my four weeks sojourn there was no rank nor grade that had not said the pleasant word to me from the stevedore to the throne if i could express my thanks for this i would do it but there are thanks which cannot be put into words words are not adequate that proud honor which was conferred upon me by the most illustrious of all universities and which carried with it the added honor of being proffered not on the spot but from over sea carried with it yet another and still higher distinction since in conferring it upon me subordinately lord curson was conferring it first of all upon my great country as he said in his letter using just that phrase and so as i stood in his stately presence and listened in innocent and ignorant contentment to his melodious latin compliments i could not help holding my head a little high for i realized that i had surpassed my life's loftiest ambition since whether i deserved the great place or not i was nevertheless representing in my person and properly gowned in imposing scarlet one of the giant nations of the earth you yourself my lord bishop are representing in your person to-night another giant nation and we offer you honor and good-will and affection and through you we offer them to england whom god preserve end of bishop speech read by john greenman this is section 122 of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain story told to garrison children hamilton bermuda april 6 1908 read by john greenman as i was on my way up the hill i saw a cat jump over a wall and that reminded me of a little incident of my childhood that may interest you i was a little boy once on a time and before that i was a little girl perhaps though i don't remember it there was a good deal of cholera around the mississippi valley in those days and my mother used to dose us children with a medicine called patterson's patent painkiller she had an idea that the cholera was worse than the medicine but then she had never taken the stuff it went down our insides like liquid fire and fairly doubled us up i suppose we took fifty bottles of that painkiller in our family i used to feed mine to a crack in the floor of our room when no one was looking one day when i was doing this our cat whose name was peter came into the room and i looked at him and wondered if he might not like some of that painkiller he looked hungry and it seemed to me that a little of it might do him good so i just poured out the bottle and put it before him he did not seem to get the real effect of it at first but pretty soon i saw him turn and look at me with a queer expression in his eyes and the next minute he jumped to the window and went through it like a cyclone taking all the flower pots with him and seeing that cat on the wall just now reminded me of the little incident of my childhood 
after many years end of story read by john greenman this is section 123 of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain interview new york april 13th 1908 mark twain had just returned from bermuda read by john greenman birds of a feather you know the rest of it it's a terrible strain this being a financier it is also a strain traveling with one i offered to loan rogers two dollars though i knew i was taking an awful risk rogers thought it was simply a courtesy and so did not take me up now i am two dollars ahead i have returned from my trip a reformer i have joined the ranks of the anti-noise society i have retired both from the making of after-dinner speeches and the lecture platform no one can tolerate noise you know unless they are the noise makers i am through making a noise and so i now insist on quiet mrs rice started her crusade at the right time for me he was asked what he thought of the scheme to improve interior waterways by dredging a fourteen-foot channel down the mississippi river i have no sentimental interest in such a project and i have too many realities to deal with to be chasing a will-o'-the-wisp when the almighty built this earth he knew very well that a fourteen-foot channel from chicago to the gulf would have been a very excellent and much needed thing but he also knew that it would tax even his resources if there were fourteen banks of england behind the scheme and fourteen more behind them there would not be enough available money to finance the scheme i know the mississippi valley and its oozy soil too well the digging of the channel would be but the beginning a thousand dredges could not keep it clear he talked of high seas en route on sunday he said when he was wearing his white suit and standing at the stern rail with dorothy sturgis of boston a great wave washed aboard and drenched them both end of interview read by john greenman this is section 124 of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain dinner speech new york postgraduate medical school and hospital dinner delmonico's new york january twentieth nineteen o nine read by john greenman the chairman introducing twain mentioned a recent burglary at twain's connecticut home gentlemen and doctors this is the first opportunity i have had to thank the postgraduate for the honorary membership conferred upon me two years ago a distinction which is a real distinction and which i prize as highly as any one could i am glad to be among my own kind to-night i was once a sharpshooter but now i practice a much higher and equally as deadly a profession it wasn't so very long ago that i became a member of your cult and for the time i've been in the business my record is one that can't be scoffed at as to the burglars i am perfectly familiar with these people i have always had a good deal to do with burglars not officially but through their attention to me i never suffered anything at the hands of a burglar they have invaded my house time and time again they never got anything then those people who burglarized our house in september 
we got back the plated ware they took off we jailed them and i have been sorry ever since they did us a great service they scared off all the servants in the place i consider the children's theater of which i am president and the postgraduate medical school as the two greatest institutions in the country this school in bringing its twenty thousand physicians from all parts of the country bringing them up to date and sending them back with renewed confidence has surely saved hundreds of thousands of lives which otherwise would have been lost when the distinction of an honorary membership in the postgraduate college was conferred upon me i felt it my duty to put aside other matters for a time and qualify myself for the position before beginning to practice i have been practicing now for seven months when i settled on my farm in connecticut in june i found the community very thinly settled and since i have been engaged in practice it has become more thinly settled still this gratifies me as indicating that i am making an impression on my community i suppose it is the same with all of you i beg you to allow me to read a paper which i have prepared for your instruction a very short one i am only a country doctor out on a farm in connecticut but i suppose you are similarly situated around over the united states out in the back settlements the paper which i am now to read to you is entitled on the three great laws to be observed in the treatment of bright's disease of the kidneys first the first great law to be observed when professionally approaching the patient whom an all-wise providence has deemed it necessary to inflict with that always serious and often fatal you know you can't carry on a great work competently without organization so as soon as i had taken up my residence last june in the house i had built on the high hill overlooking the distant farms and the deep solitudes i started a branch of the postgraduate and paid my alma mater the deserved compliment of naming it for her the reading connecticut branch of the new york postgraduate college of medicine of course the practice of medicine and surgery in a remote country district has its disadvantages but in my case i am happy in a division of responsibility i practice in conjunction with a horse doctor a sexton and an undertaker the combination is airtight and once a man is stricken in our district escape is impossible for him these four of us three in the regular profession and the fourth an undertaker are all good men there is bill ferguson the reading undertaker bill is there in every respect he is self-made and self-educated he intends to go on with his education by and by but at present he still signs his name with a rubber stamp like my old southern friend he is one of the finest planters anywhere then there is jim ruggles the horse doctor ruggles is one of the best men i have got he is not well up in medicine as yet but he is an elegant horse doctor one of the very best i think ferguson doesn't make any money off him 
you see the combination started this way when i got up to reading and had become a doctor i looked around to see what my chances were for aiding in the great work the first thing i did was to determine what manner of doctor i was to be being a connecticut farmer i naturally consulted my pharmacopoeia and at once decided to become a farmiopath then i got circulating about and got in touch with ferguson and ruggles ferguson joined readily in my ideas but ruggles kept saying that while it was all right for an undertaker to get aboard he couldn't see where it helped horses well we started to find out what was the trouble with the community and it didn't take long to find out that there was just one disease and that was race suicide and driving about the countryside i was told by my fellow farmers that it was the only rational human and valuable disease but it is cutting into our profits so that we'll either have to stop it or we'll have to move where was i oh yes uh, well <clears throat> as i was saying uh, the first great law to be observed when professionally approaching a patient whom an all-wise president uh, no uh, providence i mean uh, we've had some funny experiences up there in reading not long ago a fellow came along with a rolling gait and a distressed face we asked him what was the matter we always hold consultations on every case as there isn't business enough for four he said he didn't know but that he was a sailor and perhaps that might help to give a diagnosis we treated him for that and i never saw a man die more peacefully danbury has the farm next to mine and is a man of jealous and sarcastic spirit and ridicules our college and does everything he can to break up our practice when we tried to raise money to build a hospital he said we didn't need a hospital what we wanted was a cemetery everybody else is respectful and calls our institution the postgraduate but he calls it the post-mortem when we've been holding a consultation in a sick room he doesn't call it that he calls it preliminary inquest well anyway his connecticut farm is a pretty poor one compared to mine and he is bitterly jealous because he can't raise as many rocks on it as i can oh well uh, let him talk if it does him good i know one thing we've improved things ever so much up there when we started in seven months ago there were lots and lots of sick people there aren't any now we are admired and looked up to and i may even say revered by everybody but that man that danbury they scatter flowers before us but he never does and they call us the big four but he calls us the four flush often i have wanted to say damn such a man but i never would it would distress my parents if i had some the first great law to be observed when professionally approaching of course we make mistakes in diagnosis everybody does especially beginners i remember the time the horse doctor uh, no it was the rubber stamp uh, came and said he had found a case the other side of the hill of a colored lady from new york suffering from nervous prostitution on account of overwork and we went there and held consultation and it wasn't so nothing nervous about it just the ordinary thing and we took hold of her and in a week she was all right 
and ready to resume her activities same as ever yes a mistake now and then in diagnosis is unavoidable no matter how careful you are now there was the instance where the horse doctor came and said he had hunted down a case of vermifuge appendix he had a good dog and we have to use dogs now because the inhabitants have become diffident and shy and when a person gets sick they conceal it and hush it up so we went there to hold a consultation and went through the usual flummery you know uh, same as you do when you are at home uh, no occasion for it nothing in it but it impresses the family and the patient hold out your tongue mm, good deal coated fetch me some sandpaper let me feel your pulse mm, ninety-four above normal indications of approaching fever stick this thing under your tongue mm, temperature hundred and seventeen in the shade fever liable to supervene at any moment and so on and so on the same old usual thing you know that you are so familiar with in your own practice we all did that and then thumped the patient on back and front and mashed our ears against his breast and listened to his works then we consulted i voted with the horse doctor for appendicitis and dead against the obstetrician who said with decision and urgently gents this ain't no appendicitis there's something the matter with this feller's umbilical cord he used to be before the mast before he came with us and he wanted to get it out and take a reef in it and tauten it up the undertaker wouldn't give an opinion i reckon you've all noticed yourselves that in consultations you never can get the undertaker to show his hand when there's a disagreement so there was a majority for the appendix for the employment of the caesarean operation to get it out well after considerable rummaging around we got it out but it turned out to be a lung uh, this wouldn't have made so much difference ordinarily uh, but it did this time because this was the only one he had his appendix was dangling in a bottle in the parlor but we didn't know it a fine man he was a great loss just an ideal patient always ailing thought he was anyway always paid up promptly never looked at the bill often he would pay the same old bill four times and never say a word same as if it was a gas bill and he couldn't help himself yes a fine man and a great loss but he is gone gone from us never to return and we shall have to live within our means now the three great laws to be observed especially and particularly in the first stage of bright's disease of the kidneys in our practice we mainly adhere to the ancient and time-proven systems of those princes of the medical arts gallon and hippocrates and euripides and cathartides and deuteronomy and those others we believe in bleeding a patient as long as he danbury that rotten danbury says but never mind that in my opinion danbury is a man whose statements are based solely on malignity and jealousy and a wanton desire to injure and even destroy the reading branch of this great and noble institution the postgraduate college of new york and i for one am above repeating anything he says or in any other way taking notice of him why once 
he said and it was only a week ago he was talking about our branch to another infidel and he said oh yes the post-mortem's all right now that it's prosperous and has got a move on got a move on that's just in his line slang is now that it's prosperous and got a move on they've set up a coat of arms device huniadi label motto constipation is the thief of time now that is just a plain straight-out lie that's all it is it is true that we've got a coat of arms but it's not a huniadi label it is a facsimile of the seal of our great original here and the motto on it sheds luster upon both our great original and its reading branch to wit we are sternly opposed to adulterated drugs we are sternly opposed to all forms of adultery except those which custom has addicted us to uh, the first great law to be observed when professionally approaching the patient whom an all-wise providence has deemed it necessary to afflict with that always serious and often fatal malady bright's disease of the kidneys uh, but it is too late to read it now i will take it to your homes and read it to you there end of dinner speech read by john greenman this is section 125 of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain dinner speech lotus club dinner for andrew carnegie new york march 17 1909 read by john greenman twain was introduced as saint mark i am glad that at last a man has been found with justice enough in his heart to pay me the compliment which i have so long deserved and which has been denied me by so many generations of supposedly intelligent beings ranking me with the saints there is nothing which pleases me more than that because there is nothing left which i have deserved more than just that i have ranked myself with st andrew for several years and i really think that this should have been a dinner to the two of us as st andrew was born on the same day in the same year as i was if st andrew had not been born as early as he was on the thirtieth of november i should stand now about where he stands he got in a little ahead of me st clair there is a saint but a minor sort of saint he is a missourian so am i look at st clair mcalway you wouldn't think he came from a state like that he looks so proud and respectable the state of missouri has for its coat of arms a barrel head and two missourians are on each side of it leaning there together with the motto a misleading motto altogether which says united we stand divided we fall now it is an interesting thing st andrew here is here as a special guest and he has heard himself complimented and complimented and complimented you know it is anybody's experience who has had any large experience in being the chief guest at a banquet and you must know how entirely undeserved that entire proceeding is for the reason 
that the chairman begins by filling him up with compliments and while they are well done they are not quite high enough to meet the demand now this man has suffered this evening from hearing compliments poured out on him apparently with lavishness but he knows deep down in his heart that if he could overcome his diffidence he could improve those compliments but he tries to dissemble as our chief guest always does look at the expression he has got on now and the man always thinks he is doing well anybody who knows knows that it is a pretty awkward performance that diffidence that he is working on his countenance doesn't deceive anybody but it is always interesting to see what people will find to say about a man it is not a matter of what carnegie has done for i would have done it myself if i had had to i don't know just what mr lawrence told you about how mr carnegie came to the rescue of this club when it was likely to get into trouble for i came in late but i judge from remarks that followed that he did tell you about that and that it was a fine thing to do and they tell me that it was at a banquet given by the lotus club to me it was at that banquet that mr carnegie had that inspiration but of course he gets the entire credit it never occurs to anybody that perhaps i furnished that inspiration well, i don't say i did i live a modest life and people can see that by my features i don't want to advertise the way others do why the first thing that mr carnegie starts out to tell you is what scotland has contributed to this world it has contributed everybody that has been of any value to the united states i am not denying it i am saying that it is momentous that's all i don't know that andrew carnegie and mr tower told it but they all came from dunfermline what would have happened if all scotland had turned out i understand that mr carnegie claims that columbus was born in dumfernlin and he discovered the country and two or three other men established religion where they didn't have any and from this fact they go on distributing dumfernlin people all over this country and acquiring advantages thereby mr tower moved back and called his hand one or two points better well i don't know how far tower did go but he furnished us a saint out of scotland that i always thought was from ireland that is not the right thing to do on st patrick's day st patrick was well enough not st andrew's equal but well enough i don't think mr tower ought to back him up at this time and go on distributing scotchmen out of dunferlin st clair mcalway followed up the compliment with a veritable compliment of compliments away on top of anything that these men have been able to pay mr carnegie when they were trying as largely as they could mr mcalway makes a compliment away beyond all others beyond which nobody can go when he says that there is a man who wants to pay more taxes than are charged to him i have never listened to such extravagance of compliment and i have never seen a case when it was so well deserved well mcalway had to come in and pay his compliment and mcalway did it very well and so did gilder very well for a poet 
and he took the opportunity to advertise his magazine and that it has the distinction of having mr carnegie as a contributor but worse than that he said that it pays mr carnegie otherwise you might feel that his magazine was getting that literature for nothing now he gets that into the associated press in the morning and his magazine will fly pretty high and mighty and the people will hear of mr carnegie and the next thing gilder will be trying to hire me i have gone on through this world now nearly seventy-four years and all through it i have preserved uh, all that i have preserved is my diffidence my chief virtue a moderate modesty and diffidence i am getting pretty old now likely to run out and can't work but i am going to sit down and before i sit down i do want to wish for mr carnegie long life and continued prosperity and eventually a measure of respectability end of dinner speech read by john greenman This is section 126 of Mark Twain Speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Remarks The Mrs. Tewksbury's School Graduation, Baltimore, Maryland, June 9, 1909. Read by John Greenman. This is the last transcribed public speaking performance of Mark Twain. One final comment was recorded several months later. I don't know what to tell you girls to do. Mr. Martin has told you everything you ought to do, and now I must give you some don'ts. There is nothing for me to do but to tell you young ladies what not to do. There are three things that you should never do on any occasion. First, girls don't smoke that is don't smoke to excess i am seventy-three and one-half years old and have been smoking seventy-three of them but i never smoke to excess that is i smoke in moderation only one cigar at a time second don't drink that is uh, don't drink to excess third uh, don't marry i mean uh, to excess now if you young ladies will refrain from all these things you will have all the virtues that any one will honor and respect another thing i want to say and that is that honesty is the best policy that is an old proverb but you don't want ever to forget it in your journey through life i remember when i had just written innocence abroad when i and my partner wanted to start a newspaper syndicate we needed three dollars and did not know where to get it while we were in a quandary i espied a valuable dog on the street i picked up the canine and sold him to a man for three dollars afterward the owner of the dog came along and i got three dollars from him for telling him where the dog was so i went back and gave the three dollars to the man whom i sold it to and I have lived honestly ever since. End of Remarks Read by John Greenman This is section 127 of Mark Twain Speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. September 21, 1909, exactly seven months before his death. Read by John Greenman mark twain spoke briefly in stormfield connecticut 
at a benefit concert for the Mark Twain Library. His daughter Clara sang with some famous concert performers, and Mark Twain said, My daughter is not so famous as these gentlemen, but she is ever so much better looking. End of Final Remarks by Mark Twain And End of Mark Twain Speaking Read by John Greenman